You can turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, so we'll be there in just a few moments. I want you all to know when we were praying for the teachers, at first I felt like Iron Man. I was going to shoot something out of my hands, but then I realized that Iron Man actually is destructive, so I was going to be shooting pain. And so then for my gamers, then I thought of I, I was Zenyatta, throwing a, throwing a healing orb on each of the teachers, just to fill them with healing. So uh, it's a good moment to be able to pray for our teachers. We appreciate what you're doing. I know this may be a shock to some of you, but I have actually played on a softball team. I know, it's crazy, right? There's a time in my life, even though basketball is my preferred and better sport, that I participated in softball. Matter of fact, when I was at the end of my high school, perhaps maybe right out of high school, I was on a softball team for the Central Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas, and we played. And oftentimes, I felt exactly as I did then, I felt this responsibility to be like a spiritual leader in the group. I had surrendered to ministry early, and so I feel this responsibility to be the spiritual leader of my softball team. And we're playing this softball team, and we have both members and people who were invited guests would come and play softball with Central Baptist Church on their shirt. And so we're playing softball, and one of the players, I don't remember his name. It's a long time ago, man. Give me a break. I don't remember his name, but one of the players on there let out a curse word. <laughs> it was my responsibility to make sure that he knew that he was wearing Central Baptist Church on his shirt, and that never again should I hear from him while wearing that shirt, a curse word, because he was representing both the church and God. And I tore into him. And I walked back to my second base position with pride in my heart. Not now, but I did then. Along about the same time, somewhere in the same vicinity of that time, there was an individual who was a part of the youth group with me whom I overheard a conversation from my father and knew that he was about to get in trouble because he was dipping snuff. And I went to him, member of the church, part of the youth group, and worked with him to try to get him out of trouble for disobeying his parents and participating in snuff. And I walked away from that feeling pride. By the way, my dad found out about that, and I didn't feel pride very long on that one. <laughs> I felt pain. But what I started to realize in my own heart and life is I'm not that different now. I'm very boisterous and loud, and perhaps you can join me in this thought process. I'm very boisterous and loud about those who are failing to live up to a moral code that I believe is important. Many of us will declare very emphatically the dangers of homosexuality. Many of our voices will scream passionately, don't represent America like that. How are you representing the God-fearing country of America with what you're doing? And yet at the same time, I'm often saying nothing to my brethren who are sinning. So with this in mind, I want you to read with me 1 Corinthians Chapter 5. I want you to know I'm preaching this message because I was reading this in my office, got done, walked up into pastor's office who's enjoying his vacation, laid it down and go, look at that. I believe for most of you, all I'll have to do is read this passage. It's not difficult to understand. It's not complicated. It's just not being done. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are arrogant. 
Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Cleanse out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch as indeed you are. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore let us observe the feast not with old leaven or with leaven of malice and evil but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you, to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders. Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove evil persons from among you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now clearly this is talking and dealing with people who are in the beginning saying this is sexually immoral people. Here it is, sexually immoral people. You have a, someone in your class. That, that's what the topic is about. It actually is about someone inside the church who they know is, is having a continual sexual relationship with either the, their stepmom is what it seems to read through. Their stepmom, which is declared to be wrong in Leviticus. And so he's saying this is the, this is the topic. And we sometimes think that in the Old Testament church they were kind of hung up on sexuality and that's why sexuality always comes up because in that era they were kind of hung up and a little uptight about sexuality and so the reason why the new testament continually is talking about sexuality is because they're uptight about that but actually the opposite is the case the reason why sexuality is continually bringing, being brought up is because there is this conflict that's happening between the current culture of that time the greek culture and the new culture that's coming with christianity and so they were constantly being faced with this issue because they were the exact opposite of hung up. And so it's coming up. And so immediately we can get swept away into this thought process that it's about sexual immorality and think this is something saying, hey, let's be pure sexually and miss the boat. No, let's be pure sexually. But we'll miss the boat. Okay? And, and so here he's saying, this is the area, but I want you to look and see that he says to them, uh, you're arrogant. What are they arrogant about? When he calls them arrogant, and later he says you're boasting, what are they arrogant about? I think they're not so different than we are. Because it, it says afterwards, shouldn't you be filled with grief and removed from your congregation the one that did it? Shouldn't you be filled with grief? So he counters their arrogance with what should be is that of grief. So they're dealing with this sin issue. He counters it and says, you're arrogant, and what you should be is filled with grief. I believe they're arrogant in their tolerance. I believe they're feeling pride about the way that they are tolerating and allowing for people to have wrong sinful behavior in their life unchecked because you're arrogant they're filled with his pride and he says it's not the way it should be now he does this great little verse that kind of confuses this is the one thing kind of a little bit where he says hand them over to satan did you hear that man hand them over to satan that seems a little harsh doesn't it brad i mean that's a little rough it's good to have you sitting there, Brad. That, that seems a little rough. And so we get this thought process that he's saying, all right, they're doing wrong. Throw them out there into the place where Satan can just have his way with them. And it kind of is. 
But the thought process really here is the idea of allowing for them to experience the difficulties of their sinful choice for the goal of, so that, for the goal of restoration of themselves in their spirit. But it's scary to us, isn't it? We, we read this and most of us are like, what? This is not what we want at church. And it becomes very difficult for us to begin to look over it. He challenges them. You're going to have trouble because what you're doing is taking unleavened and leavened bread and mixing it together. Now, the unleavened bread comes up in Scripture. It begins with when they're doing the Passover, right? The Passover, it tells them not to have any unleavened bread. The beginning of the whole unleavened bread is really all about speed, right? Leavened bread is yeast. It's got yeast. Unleavened, no yeast. doesn't rise. It was about speed. It was like, don't have any leavened bread. Just cook it because you're on your way out here. They've been slaves for 400 years. He's saying, I'm fixing to deliver you. You don't have time for leavened bread. You've got to get unleavened bread because you're going to eat and go. That's the mentality. Boom, here it comes. Rest you. Jesus kind of takes that again and when he's dealing with the Pharisees and gives this thought process and it begins to start being symbolic of sin. The yeast is becomes symbolic of this is jesus that kind of makes this transition where he's saying don't have the yeast of the pharisees don't allow for their corruption to become a part of you and corrupt you jesus is the beginning of this thought process right and so then paul is picking up on this when he's talking about the unleavened bread and the leavened bread and that you can't lump it in there it'll defile the whole loaf and so he's telling them hey we don't want unleavened and leavened mixed together. Again, we're like, what? This doesn't sound right. And there's a tension that's created inside of us as we read through this and we hear him say, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a verb abusive, a drunkard, or a swindler. Don't even eat with such a one? And that doesn't sound right to us. Now, in their day and culture, eating with a person was very symbolic of a su support. So if I went to your table, if I came over to Ted's table, and I sat down with Ted at his table, I'm endorsing Ted. That I'm saying, yes, Ted, that's the man. It's a, it's a real symbolic part of what the culture would do and the way that they would view and see that. And so when he's saying don't even eat with such a one, he's talking about because if you went to them, you're putting your stamp of approval, your endorsement upon. Everybody would read it as you're saying that's right. That's the reason he's saying don't even eat with such a one. The little caveat where he says, I'm not talking about those outside the world, is really interesting, right? They're not talking about those outside. I love the reasoning, because who, who would you be with? Who would you be with? Where would you go? That is the outside world. You see, that's, that's everybody. If I was talking about them, I'd just say, don't associate with anybody. Because that's the reality of the outside world. It's a rough one. You're feeling the same tension I felt that day. There's lots of tension that comes from it. You're a little uncomfortable because you're afraid I'm going to deal with your sin. You're a little uncomfortable because you're not sure how, how the way that we view and see God fits into what this is saying. You're extremely uncomfortable because it's nothing like what we do. Me too. Me too. And so it puts us in this tension moment. And so for you, I want to just take three things that I think that are true that we need to apply from this passage. Number one, having expectations of personal purity for those inside the church is not legalistic or judgmental. It's biblical. Let me read it again. Having expectations of personal purity for those inside the church is not legalistic or judgmental. It's biblical. 
That's just true. There is a desire for there to be purity amongst them. It's in 1 Peter 1, 16, it says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's not talking to people outside the church. That's talking about the church. It's talking about those who are members of the church. Be holy, he's saying, for I am holy. This is what God is declaring unto you. <laughs> Romans 12, 1. I feel this this morning. I feel this deeply. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of everything that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. There's a call in scripture for our lives to be pure. And having an expectation of purity inside of the church is the right thing to do. Paul says, I've already made a judgment. Right? He's telling them, it's okay for you to do this for me the distance because the activity has already been declared wrong. I'm telling you that it's wrong. His judgment is coming because of the truth of the scripture. I told you in Leviticus, it told him, you can't do this. This isn't even a... He says, even those guys there don't do this, right? So their activity was worse than those outside the church, inside the church to do more, but that's not the basis of it because the outside world has said not to do it. The basis is because God's told us not to do it. Our expectation for personal purity is based on what God has commanded us to do. And there is a danger, Paul is communicating, in allowing unchecked sinful behavior to continue in the house of God. Now, analogies in Scripture can get tricky. They can get tricky, and we begin to look at the analogies and they kind of try to play them all out, and they get tricky. And this one's the same way. Because one of the difficulties that begins to happen is we get this thought process that what he's saying is to remove all the, the leaven and the unleavened, make sure that they're separated, and we have to do that. And we begin to think in that lines about our salvation, and the reality is I can't remove the leaven from myself. God does that. God does that. Paul is not saying here, separate because, you know, we've got to make sure all sin is separated out and it's a way, and you've got to do that. It's your responsibility to separate sin from your life. You can't. If we think that we'll take the ownership of sin in all ourselves, it's not what he's saying. He is telling us that inside the house of God, we want for it to be a place of purity. And if we know that purity is not existing, we need to deal with it. Feel free to come and tell me afterwards how it's not. I'd love it. But it is. And so there is this expectation. It's not just that it's a personalized, removed away. Well, you know, we all need to be personally pure, but it's something that we all individually do on our own. No, <laughs> he's saying no. He's saying no, you need to deal with it. You need to engage into it. You need to put the expectation out there for it. And it's not a legalism that says there's certain rules that I say are yes and certain rules that I say are no. It is following up and living according to God's standards. And this place, the body of Christ, being a place where we hold each other accountable to do that. That's tough. Can I tell you, I don't think there's anybody in this room who really wants to do that. There's not one. Just so you know, I'm not saying this because I want to do that. I don't want to do that. And neither do you. I'm preaching it because the passage says that. Orrin Wearsby says, while Christians are not to judge one another's motives or ministries, we are certainly expected to be honest about each other's contact. Uh, conduct. Paul saying it's time to clean house. It's an attitude of mourning for the sin, not an attitude of judgment on the person. It mourns. Did you see that? It says you're arrogant because you're tolerant, but what it's asking for is a mourning. How is it that I can see my brother who has been liberated from sin, living in sin, and not mourn that he has allowed himself to be captivated by sin once again? That's what Paul's saying. And my heart that mourns for that moves me to action, motivates me to move, keeps me from just standing still. There is an expectation for personal purity for those inside the church, and that is not legalistic 
judgmental. It's biblical. Number two, demanding personal purity from those outside the church is unrealistic, unloving, and irrelevant. Demanding personal purity from those outside the church is unrealistic, unloving, and real irrelevant. The reason it is unrealistic is because the entire law was written not so that we could be holy. The law was written to expose to us that we cannot be holy. That's its purpose. And so when I go to the outside world and say you need to live according to the law, I'm saying you need to strive to fail. Now who's encouraged by that? Here's what I want you to do. You can never attain it, but keep going. And let me yell at you every time you don't succeed. That's the mentality we take sometimes in dealing with our culture, with our community, with the people outside. We are thinking that if we just tell them loud enough, it's God's standard that they'll live up to it. And God says, they won't. We're completely backwards on it can you see how unloving that is to declare to them you must do this when they're incapable of doing it on their own when without the presence and the power of the holy spirit they never can reach that it's unrealistic it's unloving and it's irrelevant my goal is not to try to tell them that they need to live holy. I want to tell them they're not holy. That's the whole part of the gospel, isn't it? The gospel message comes and says, here's the deal. You can never be righteous and holy on your own. It's irrelevant for me to tell them to live holy. What I want to declare is that you're not meeting God's standard. This is what it may be like. This is how I see that in my mind's eye. I come upon a drowning person who is dying because they're drowning. And I come up to them and say, well, hey, did you eat 20 minutes before you went swimming? Because it's not good. You're going to get a cramp. You got a cramp? Now, if you wouldn't do that, you'd be okay. Stupid, right? Stupid. Even worse, sometimes we'll say, hey, I'd love to save you, but your swimsuit doesn't match. Who cares? It's irrelevant. In the moment, what they need me to assess is that they are drowning. They're in despair. Their life is ebbing out of them. And I need to move to action and see lovingly, I can do something about that dive in and save them that's where the lost world is they don't need us to raise their bar of standard of living they need us to see them as drowning in sin they are slaves to sin they are not going to escape it without the presence and power of jesus christ he's the life preserver all i'm really doing is throwing it to them here he is he's the way he walked across the gap for you through the cross of Calvary. It makes a way that you, the one who can never live up to who God is, what he desires, his standard, you'll always be short. But God loved you so much that he showed his love by sending his son to die for you while you were still a sinner. That's what scripture tells us. He didn't clean you up and say, once you got everything going, I'll be willing to give my life for you. He says, you're not going to make it without me. And I gave my life for you. And our job is to throw that life preserver to people. That's what matters in their life, not what they're doing. We got it backwards. Can you see it? Look at the way that our churches function. We function with a tolerant level that we call in our pride loving on the members of those who should know better than to be living in sin and an intolerance for those who can do nothing about it and we say that that's loving to them. We're wrong. We must repent. 
We must see it and begin to shift and see it the way that God desires for us to do it. Stop trying to check whether people have followed the rules when they're drowning and just save them. Throw them the lifeline. God will then work in their heart to change them. He'll give them a matching swimsuit. I would mismatch all the time except for my wife. She keeps me matching. Right? If I was a single guy without my wife, I, it would be crazy how I would dress, you know? But I have my wife. When those people are redeemed and saved and out of the pit, they'll have the Holy Spirit. Carol, don't get the big head. I'm not saying you're the Holy Spirit. They'll have the Holy Spirit, which can begin to work in their lives. And then they'll have brothers and sisters who can come alongside in that loving way. This passage is not something we should run through, but something we should embrace. That I see each of you with such a loving way in my heart that I will not allow sin to own you. And that I see each person outside with such a love in my heart that I know that they are owned by sin. Number three. If all of that is true, and I believe it is, then creating a community that is desired by both those inside and outside is our utmost responsibility. If everything we just discussed is true, then our priority here inside this place is to create a community that both to those inside and outside is desirable. That's our goal. How, Paul says, right, what does he tell to do? You tell me, what does he tell to do to the person who's not living up to sin, uh, the, the purity status inside the church? Tell me, tell me, what does it tell to do? I don't want to be the one to say it. You have to say it. Huh? Call them out. Call them out. Kick them out, right? It's, it's kind of, we think kick them out, right? So it's, it's what it's saying is like, boom, don't even associate with them, right? So kind of moving it away. Now let me ask you this. If you don't care to be here, what good is it for me to tell you you can't be here? He's wanting for there to be this motivation that what happens is I say, man, there's sin in your life, and just so you know, this is unrepentant sin that's been dealt with and they won't change. There's a process that the Bible tells us in dealing with sins in people's life, and our first step isn't to say, you sinned, you're gone. Our first step is to come along lovingly and say, hey, it's getting you. Let's help you get away from it. Then it's for me to take somebody else, you know. I went, Brad, you got the good, you get the bad. I go to Brad and say, hey, it's getting you. And he says, I don't care. I go get Jason. I said, Jason, let's go talk to him, man. He's your family. Let's go talk to him. Let's tell him it's getting him. And we go to him and we say, it's getting you. And he says, I don't care. And then I go and I say, listen, church leadership, deacons, let's go. We've got to go and fight for our brother. It's getting him. And we can't let it get him and we go and we surround him and we fight for him and he says I don't care I don't care I don't care I don't care then we say you're going to have to live through that and we're going to love you we're going to pray for you we're going to be there for you we're right here but you're going to have to learn through that and you are allowing for the enemy to destroy you don't I hate to see it happen to you and they'll have to walk through it until the destruction of his flesh is enough that it redeems his spirit and the end goal is restoration. And he comes back and says, I care. We say, yes, we care. And we love him back into the family. That's the process that's on here. But if there's no desire to be a part, if in being out there on his own, he doesn't care that he miss us, what good is it? They felt this protection and provision from the church. The church provided protection and provision for them. And so being away from the church would be a loss. I believe that's why Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. This is dealing with our attitude inside the church that we love on the people inside God's community so fiercely 
that if they were to be removed from it, they'd miss it. So I want you in thinking of that way, that we love on the people inside the community so fiercely that if they were removed from it, they would miss it. Number one, I want you to think, how do you feel about your community here? Do you feel that way? Some of you might. Some of you might not. And number two, what are you doing to help foster that community for your brothers and sisters here? What are we doing that's building it where the desire is to be here so much? And I'm telling you, when people on the outside see this unbelievable community of love that goes, man, I know I'm not going to miss my church. You kidding? That's the greatest place I am any time during the week. You don't know what my church is like. I can't preach that into existence, and neither can pastor, and neither can bring. It won't be by preaching. You know what? We can't even, and people connect more even, but we can't even worship. Ted can't even put together a service that's going to create that in your life. That's in the way that we build community with one another. That others then hear about our connection to here in such a passionate way that they feel they're missing out. I love the way it deals with sincerity and truth. He says you got to do it with sincerity and truth. We can't just have a sincerity that I truly care for you, and I'm just truly going to care for you with the absence of truth. This is what some of us try to do. Nor can we say, I'm going to have a lot of truth for you. I have truth for you. I have truth for you. But there's no sincerity of care. It's sincerity and truth is the way that we develop and build that community with one another that makes this important. I think I fail at this at times. My vision becomes the wrong distorted way. My goals become the wrong distorted way. Our goal should be to create a community that is desired by those inside and outside the church. You know our discipleship groups are a big part of that. That's why we're launching the discipleship groups. You know, is this burden and passion for creating that community is the reason why we are pushing the whole discipleship group. We believe that it fosters an environment where there is a connection and the individuals who initially see and say, hey, my brother, something's not right. Because we put on such facades when we're here. I'm asking you to join us in working to make this an environment that people desire to be in. We can't do it without you. We can't. But we can do it with you. The movement of the Spirit of God in our lives where we live according to how He desires for us can accomplish where we experience a community that moves people, that changes lives, that makes them care about what we feel in their lives that allows us to be able to challenge. Hmm. When there is no action behind our words, others, neither inside or outside, are not inspired but disappointed. When there's no action behind our words, neither inside or outside, people are not inspired but disappointed. I'm just saying, let's put action to them. Let's put action to our words and create the environment that's desirous. God, I just come before you right now and I just pray that you would work in our hearts. That you would move us to see the need of those that we are dealing with. And God, I pray that you just would help us to apply this passage to our hearts in the way that you desire. I pray that you'd work on anyone's heart who is filled with anger that's ready to unleash on their brother and sister and feel like it's been justified, that you would soften, give them a mourning for the sin, not an arrogance. I pray, Lord, that for those who are willing to turn a blind eye to the chaos in their brother's life, that you'd motivate them to see the devastation that it is. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in all of our hearts to recognize that a lost world is lost and needs you. You will judge them. We will send a lifeline. 
preciousness of your son, Jesus Christ. God, if anyone in here today does not know the joy of you as their Lord and Savior, and it's trapped in their sin and drowning, may they know we care not if they have eaten or not. We care not what their swimsuit looks like. We care that they know Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.